Now, analysts project that the central banks in Africa's biggest economies are set to maintain tight monetary policies to contend with persistent inflation. Egypt, South Africa, Morocco, Kenya and Ghana are poised to keep their key interest rates at current levels while they assess risks to inflation from domestic and global factors, including geopolitical tensions in the Middle East. However, Nigeria's rate decision looks like a toss-up between a hike and a hold. This morning, joining us to unpack this is Professor Andrew Rowe, an economist at Stellenbosch Business School, Stellenbosch University. Thank you so much, Professor Andrew Rowe, for joining us on the show. Thank you and good afternoon to you and all your viewers. Of course. Now, let us start with the factors fueling inflation in many African countries. What are they and what do you make of how the various central banks have been handling them? Yes, well, I think maybe this is go back a few months and remind ourselves that not too long ago across the entire planet, inflation rates were rising at a speed not seen for many, many years, including, of course, the so-called developed countries. And so we saw across the world interest rates moving upwards and moving up quite dramatically. And this is all fueled by a number of things, ranging from obviously pent-up demand, I think post-COVID-19 pent-up demand started coming through. Add to that the fact that many countries had adopted a very, let's say, relaxed monetary policy. That started coming through. And this is all accelerated by, a couple of years ago, the problems in Russia and Ukraine, obviously influencing the oil price. So four years ago, the oil price was $10 a barrel. Uh, two years later, 2022, $135 a barrel. Now down to $80 or $90, but still nearly nine times higher than four years ago. Then, of course, food prices started accelerating, again, partly due to the crisis in, in Russia and Ukraine. Uh, supply chain problems started exerting an influence. Uh, and all of this resulted in, as I say, a rapid increase in inflation across the world, and along with that, rising interest rates. The good news is that in most countries, certainly internationally, uh, inflation rates are coming down again, and interest rates have been put on hold, as you quite rightly point out in the introduction. Again, across the plan with one or two exceptions. So the question now arising there, and I think here in Africa as well, is not so much whether interest rates are going to come down, but rather when they're going to come down. And I do believe that central banks are taking a very conservative stance here in Africa as well. And I think rightly so by saying, well, let's not be too hasty. Let's not lower interest rates too quickly. We think the time is getting riper and riper for that to happen. But let's just check things out a little bit further. If there were to be some kind of unexpected inflationary shock, we don't, don't want to be caught sort of with our pants down. So let's keep things steady for now and start gearing up towards an increase later, sorry, a decrease later on in the year. So what are those things that they are, that they are wary of? As you pointed out, the Middle East crisis, always problematic geopolitical tensions. Uh, one hears stories that um, shipping lines are not using the Suez Canal so much, but rather taking a longer route that obviously adds to the cost of transport. Uh, and depending on countries, there might be idiosyncratic issues. Here in South Africa, for instance, there's a bit of a concern that inflation has edged a bit upwards in the last couple of months, still lower than what we wanted, lower than the upper range of the target, but it hasn't come down considerably. Uh, we add to that things such as continued supply chain constraints. Obviously, depending on the country, there might be uh, drought-related food shortages. Uh, there might be still concern about another increase in the oil price. Here in South Africa, wage increases might be higher than the inflation rate, which will create more inflation. So it depends on the country. But overall, I would say that central banks are erring on the side of being conservative, which is not necessarily a bad thing, although obviously it is painful for many people to try to deal with high interest rates. Uh, you mentioned that um, there are some instances in some countries where um, interest rates or where inflationary pressure have reduced. But then there are some countries that, whatever the case may be, we still see the rates hike um, going up unabated. For example, we look at Nigeria, where some economists and business owners have said that the monetary tightening stance of the CBN is ineffective 
And as a hike, uh, we see that in NPC seems to equal more inflation. So what do you make of this? Or is this just a peculiar situation to Nigeria? No, look, it's always been a, a dilemma for central banks. Because obviously when central banks use interest rates as a tool against inflation, they're actually addressing monetary factors. They're trying to slow down the growth in the money supply uh, via slow down the growth in demand for credit. And that is that is what it is. But obviously, many of the factors contributing towards inflation have nothing to do with the money supply. I've mentioned a few, such as an increase in international oil price, an increase in international shipping prices, an increase in food prices, have nothing to do with monetary aggregates. And that's the dilemma that central banks always face. They only have one or two tools, one tool really, namely manipulating the money supply. And they cannot influence Nigeria, South Africa. No one can influence the international price of oil. They can't influence the international price of food. They can't influence droughts. So they always have to kind of take, the, take on the onus, the burden of trying to reduce inflation, although knowing full well that some of the factors are beyond their control and are dependent on many other external factors. Okay, no, now... Does, sorry, can I just say, one does find out... Okay, okay. That, ...that after a while, and there's always a time lag involved, but you generally find an increase in interest rates will, after a lag of 9 to 12, or even 15 months, eventually result in a slowdown in inflation. All right. So uh, while we're actually seeing um, a change in other emerging markets like Latin America and Europe, we see that Africa's biggest economies seem to be holding on to policy tightening. And earlier on, you mentioned a cross-section of factors that actually influence what the NPC decision would be. Now, are there differences as to the reactions that we see in other continents as uh, different from what we see in Africa? And that fuels what kind of um, decision the, the NPC would eventually have to take? Probably, yes. I mean, I just mentioned the time lag involved. Uh, so in some countries, I don't want to mention names, but let's say the developed world, a very small increase in interest rates will bring about a fairly quick reaction from consumers and borrowers in terms of slowing down their demand for credit. In other countries, and I can speak about South Africa, for instance, it takes quite a significant increase in interest rates before consumers will ultimately start slowing down their demand for credit. There's a much longer time lag involved. Uh, but having said that, using interest rates is what we often call a very blunt instrument. It, it, it's difficult to fine-tune it. And we also have to think about the reality in many African countries of households struggling struggling to survive, struggling to keep their heads above water, uh, with, with incomes perhaps falling in real terms. They have to take refuge. They have no choice but to borrow money just to survive. And that, that, that's a very sad reality. It is a reality, but a sad reality. And um, we, you therefore find that very often in an African context, even with fairly high interest rates by international standards, the demand for credit carries on growing at quite a, quite, a, quite a speed. So that means that central banks have to further raise interest rates to bring about the desired effect. Okay. So let's now tie this um, to Nigeria's legal tender. Well, um, some analysts suggest that uh, the CBN would hold rates due to a steadier Naira. So do you believe that the current stability justifies pausing rate hikes, or do you prefer a further rate hike in a bid to address these inflationary pressures? Yeah, look, I, I cannot confess to an uh, intimate knowledge of, of the situation in Nigeria, but if I can just ask, try to answer the question generally, uh, one must also bear in mind there is a very close link between interest rates and the value of a country's currency. So, putting it very simplistically, if interest rates drop in a country, let's say Nigeria, but elsewhere in the world interest rates are not dropping, there's a good chance the local currency will weaken because investors might withdraw their investment, seeking higher returns elsewhere, uh, and that would result in an outflow of dollars or other foreign exchange from the country, and the country's own currency will weaken. So put differently, uh, if you want to try to stabilize a currency, it's not very wise to lower interest rates. 
again, there's always a threshold. You're never quite sure beforehand what kind of increase in interest rates are required to stabilize the currency. Because bear in mind, a currency's value is influenced by a whole host of factors, not just interest rates. But certainly, typically central banks are tasked with maintaining the internal and external stability of prices. So if inflation is rising, if a currency is coming under pressure, then it does make sense to, 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 to adopt a fairly restrictive monetary policy. Mm. And also bear something else in mind, that and this is the essence of economics, if your currency weakens, that actually creates even more inflation because you're going to import goods at a higher price. So you're importing inflation, and that just reinforces that vicious cycle. So I'm afraid it's throughout the world, but perhaps in Africa more so than others, there's a very real trade-off between high interest rates to combat inflation versus lower interest rates to try to stimulate growth. You can't do both at the same time. You can't get low inflation and high growth necessarily with one single monetary policy instrument. Mm. So if you, if you want to lower interest rates to try to uh, stimulate economic growth, chances are you're going to get more inflation and a weaker currency. If you want to combat inflation by raising interest rates, you might suppress economic growth. That's okay. the reality of economics and so-called trade-offs. Okay, um, understandable, I must say. Uh, Professor Rowe, let's leave Nigeria and quickly look at the Horn of Africa nation. That's Kenya. Now, we see that the currency has also gone from being one of the worst performing currencies in the world to the best in less than three months. And also, inflation risks have diminished due to the deceleration of the primary drivers when we talk about food and fuel prices, which are very essential to um, every citizen in, in Kenya. Uh, how would you say that um, the Kenyan government was able to achieve these uh, positivity? Well, I think it's, it's essentially uh, by deliberately adopting, let's call it conservative policies, and especially conservative monetary policies, by sticking to the sticking to their guns, uh, despite the pain involved of, of, of maintaining and retaining a strict monetary policy, is now starting to pay dividends. Uh, and that's another perhaps general message that a monetary policy, let's say a strict monetary policy, doesn't reap, doesn't yield overnight success. You've got to stick to your guns. You've got to resist the temptation when the going gets tough to relax interest rates only to discover that a year later you have to raise them even more dramatically than would otherwise be the case. Which brings me back to our sort of our current story right now and my introductory statement. I think that central banks in Africa are playing a conservative game, rather keep rates where they are and not lower them yet. It might be too premature. Let's wait a bit longer. You don't want a situation where you lower interest rates now only to discover in a year's time you were too hasty, and now you have to really considerably raise those interest rates. Mm -hmm. And I think in many ways, uh, uh, Kenya has followed such a conservative, careful approach. Okay, so we now also look at um, the dynamics of our monetary policy tools, such as rate hikes or um, cash reserve ratio. Now, while an interest rate hike is expected to be positive for investors, as it translates, of course, to real returns on their investments, especially when it is either higher or close to the inflation rate. We are also aware of the trade off in output or production, as the case may be. So is there a way whereby we can balance this? Sorry, just repeat the last, I just missed the last part of your story, sorry. So I actually asked if there's a way that we can um, achieve an equilibrium when we look at the issue around rate hikes and the cash reserve ratio as it relates to investors, what they get, and the trade-off um, production, uh, trade-off in output of production. Yeah. Again, it's kind of back to what I was saying. There's always, as you say, there's a trade-off. Uh, the, 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 the typical conservative, let's say, central bank view, it will always be our main aim in life is to control inflation. But there's a reason behind that. Because in so doing, it creates a space, it creates a more stable environment, a more attractive environment for future economic growth. And that more attractive environment would hopefully, amongst others, as you are saying, help to attract foreign investment, which, as we know, is much needed in, in Africa. 
the savings ratio, the savings rate in Africa is, is too low to finance investment from domestic sources. We need more foreign investment. We can't, we can't dispute that. And investors look at a whole range of factors, economic factors, monetary factors, but also percept, what I call perception factors, uh, risk profiles, risk analysis. And, and one of the things that favor a country, a recipient country, is having a stable macroeconomic environment, which includes, as we keep on saying, uh, inflation being under control, a currency which doesn't fluctuate too rapidly. It includes having fiscal discipline, otherwise we, we you don't see the budget deficit ballooning, and you don't see government debt becoming uncontrollable. All of these things help contribute towards, in the long term, an attraction of investment, both local and international, and eventually then pave the way for economic growth. Okay. Our oh, Professor Andrew Rowe, economist, Stellenbosch uh, Business School uh, from Stellenbosch University. Thank you so much for talking to us. It was nice having this time um, with you. Thank you very much. At this point, we want to take a look at how the EFCC and the NFIU are planning on collaborating to see how they can remove Nigeria from the um, FATF's grid list. Now, Nigeria's EFCC and FIU are set to be talking or looking at ways to ensure that Nigeria exits the Financial Action Task Force grey list. Hafsad Bakri from NFRU stressed the importance of cooperation in addressing the FATF challenges during discussions with the EFCC chairman, that is Ola Ulukoyede. Strategies include intelligence sharing and enforcing compliance to combat corruption, terrorism and insecurity. Nigeria listed in February 2023, must fulfill a 19-item action plan by May 2025 to further avoid FATF sanctions. This morning, Oladipa Jai, Head Fixed Income and FX, Chapel Hill Denham Securities, joins me to talk about this. It's nice having you around, Oladipa. Yeah, good morning. Thank you very much for making up for having me. That's nice. Now, uh, the major reason Nigeria was greatly said about the FATF was due to the strategic deficiencies and anti-money laundering mechanism, terrorism financing and proliferation of um, illicit financing regimes. Uh, what, in your opinion, are the enablers of this perceived weakness? Well, um, I think for me, I think it's more like uh, the system and the processes um, uh, that we currently have in place. Uh, of course, we have system, but the issue is that we don't have system that actually works. Uh, uh, because um, since my days in the banking industry, I, I, I understood that uh, when you do a transaction uh, worth of 10 million, a such transaction is supposed to actually be reported to NFIU. And the most time you see the bank report this, but what do we use those reports for is another thing entirely. And uh, so, so much that we have a lot of data, but we are not actually interpreting those data very well. And that's uh, one of the reasons why we found ourselves where we are currently. I think on the part of, of, of the country, uh, the process, we need to actually recalibrate the process and the system we have in place to ensure that they are full implementation. And not only the implementation, but to ensure compliance uh, with some of this, uh, with some of these system and processes that we have in place. And I think with this, uh, in no time, we will actually get out of the list. Okay. So quickly, what economic consequences does Nigeria face if it fails to exit the grey list uh, by implementing the required action plan on or before 2025? Because the talk is about if they are not able to meet up with the 19 item action plan and um, it continues to stay within that gray list purview and the possibility of even being blacklisted that it might result into dire consequences for the country what are these um, consequences that you would uh, want to um, talk about uh, for me i don't think we we want to get to that level because it's not a palatable one uh, uh, because as you speak uh, on the black list, we only have three countries. We have, uh, we are, we have, all, we also have uh, Iran on the list. And uh, imagine that you are joining those people on that list. So it simply means that uh, we won't be seeing um, inflow of foreign investments in the country. We won't see uh, investment into for, uh, foreign direct investment, foreign portfolio investment in the country. Uh, because of what shoes can you actually invest in a country that you you cannot actually uh, travel to or a country that you cannot actually uh, um, trust um, uh, 
um, um, they all rely on, on, on the process and, and the activity that is actually uh, uh, being carried on in, in such country. Uh, so it's not a place where, where we want to be because it's uh, speaking and, and not a time like this where uh, Nigeria is currently actually um, trying to actually lure foreign investors into the market uh, so as to actually uh, keep uh, the currency, uh, currency stable. Uh, it's such a time like this, not a time that you want to not discourage inflow of uh, investments in the country. So it's not a, a level where uh, we actually want to find ourselves because uh, it's going to be bad for us uh, economically. It's going to be bad for our currency. It's going to be bad in all ramifications. Also, you will also discourage some other countries from actually transacting uh, with Nigeria, considering um, us being moved in, into that list. So it's not a, a, a place where we want to be. And that's one of the reasons why we've seen uh, that uh, huge uh, marriage uh, between NFIU and the EFCC. Uh, trying to actually ensure that we get out of the gray list. Uh, of course, in the last uh, month, we've seen a lot of countries actually exiting the gray list um, after after the uh, huge compliance um, with uh, what is expected. And uh, on the bottom of Nigeria, uh, there's huge co co uh, cooperation with Financial Action Tax Force to ensure that uh, we are being removed from, from that list. Okay, so that's a critical now. You've talked about the consequences. And we now see that Nigeria is expected to submit its action plan. Now, for a country that is serious about getting off the grid list, what do you think should be the embodiment of a robust action plan that can galvanize the push um, in exiting the grid list? I think the first thing you need to identify is that what's the problem and uh, what are you expected to do? Uh, money laundering. Um, terror, terrorist activities and, and the like, corruptions and things like that. So what we just need to do is first of all ensure that we have that uh, system in place, ensure that we have good implementations uh, and ensure that we have good uh, compliance uh, levels uh, in place to ensure that uh, uh, we work within uh, what we actually want to do. And after we have done that, we can then actually now submit a such plan uh, to financial action tax force to ensure that they actually um, uh, can now work with us on, on that plan to the actualization of what, what we want to do. Uh, so for me, I, I think it's not something extraordinary that we cannot actually get that cannot actually get done. It's just something that we need to be serious about that we actually want to get this thing done and it will be done. So uh, I don't think it's anything um, out of play because those figures are there, those details are there. And at the same time, when it comes to uh, terrorism, I, 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 I think um, we need to also buckle up because uh, sometimes when you see um, uh, the case of uh, Binance, and uh, it sounds very great, and uh, uh, a lot of people applauded the government for actually switch, uh, uh, switching interactions to actually try and uh, cover what was happening in, in that direction. Um, but um, this is a country where we will take a ten step forward and we will take another five backward. And when, when, but when you hear news uh, that uh, one of the accomplices actually escaped, he also called question that are we really serious to actually actualize what we are, we are what we are saying. So we need to be deliberate and we need to show uh, that um, composure to actually actually tackle and uh, and ensure that we are out of the list. And I think it's something that we can do uh, if we uh, if we are really very serious about. Well, talking about the issue around um, dealing with um, terrorism, you said it's something that can be done if the political will is there. But then we see a Nigeria that has identified terrorist groups and their sponsors um, in the last few months. Uh, these sponsors actually pose a threat. But then in a recent report, the Intergovernmental Action Group Against Money Laundering noted that Nigeria has not explicitly criminalized the financing of foreign uh, terrorist fighters. So. Is that not a major setback when it comes to tackling the issue of terrorism in the country? Now, um, Aladipo Ajayi, you are going to answer this question, but then we'll go on a short break. When we return, I'll take your reaction on it. On Business Edge, we've been looking at the renewed collaborative effort between the EFCC and NFRU in seeing how to come up with an action plan that would help the country get off the Financial Action Task Force's gray list that is set to pose dire consequences for the country financially, economically. And we have been talking to Oladipo Ajayi, head fixed income and FX, Chapel Hill, Denham Security. So I just go back to him and continue from the point where Oladipo, you said that um, the issue around dealing with terrorism 
and all the aspects uh, that have been raised by the FATF can be done only if the will is there. But then I pointed it out to you that, of course, we know that Nigeria has identified terrorist groups and it has named sponsors in recent days. But then a recent report has come out to say that, hey, Nigeria has not criminalized um, the financing of foreign terrorist fighters and it has not even proscribed the terrorist groups, though it's faceless or nameless, as some people might say, but then a lot of people feel the Nigerian government need to proscribe it and that would help it come up with a, a, a particular kind of um, way to deal with the issue around um, terrorism uh, in the country. So um, in the failure of the Nigerian government to have this done, is that a major setback to actually tackling the issue of terrorism in the country? Yeah, thank you very much, Leko. Uh, like we said earlier, one of the things that actually uh, gets us listed or on, on, on the grid is what that uh, it's not that we don't have a measure in place, uh, but the measure, uh, measures were actually weak. And that's one of the reasons why we were listed on, on that uh, on the green list. And, uh, and part of the weakness that we talked about is just what, just what you just mentioned. And um, if you see recently, NFI, you came up with um, a list of the individuals. And also, they also mentioned that some British and uh, businesses that actually um, actually um, encourage or actually perpetrate um, uh, terrorism financing or what we are doing or that are better um, on transfer around that line. And I think uh, that's one, one side of it, uh, by actually uh, naming the people. Uh, but the next action is that what comes after? What do you want to do to them? How do you want to use them as a sample for others? Uh, for them to uh, for uh, for them to actually know that uh, this area is no is no is no gray area again and uh, and I think that's one of the things that uh, we also need. And uh, um, when I was talking earlier, I mentioned about the fact that you have a system in place, you have a process in place, and you you implement and uh, you ensure compliance uh, because one of the ways to ensure compliance is to actually make people as uh, as an example of what. Uh, you actually will actually do to people that actually perpetrate as such evil. And I think I agree to a great extent that uh, we have not um, done extraordinarily well in, in that regard. And we need to actually up our game. Uh, because, when, like I mentioned, the consequences, they actually much, much more than we can actually talk about. And it's not, uh, it won't be so good for a country that's trying to actually come out of a critical, um, very challenging economic uh, pro, uh, uh, time. And that only for us to just, uh, get ourselves enlisted in the blacklist at the end of the goal would that be that we are losing investment and nobody's looking at Nigeria as an investment destination and things like that. So I also I surely agree with you that we need to take it a step further. Uh, beyond naming uh, um, perpetrators, we need to actually ensure that there are strict sanctions uh, around people like this and also make them know that uh, um, the world is looking at this and punishment that uh, watch and when, when you do things like that, like that it means that uh, uh, people know that you are ready for business and uh, institutions like uh, financial action task, task force uh, will now actually get to actually work with you around the for full implementation of some of those things so i think i agree with you to a great extent okay so let's really look at um, what the apex bank has done recently. Now, the Central Bank of Nigeria uh, issued guidelines for the country's Bureau of Shand Operators to align BDC activities more closely with global anti-money laundering and uh, combating terrorism standards. So is that, by a stretch, a potential way of initiating the delisting process? Yeah, for me, I, I think it's a great one. But like I mentioned, we, 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 most time we normally have this process in place. And uh, I think before now, uh, this is not a new secular uh such secular has, has been out in the past but it's just about the implementation and ensure strict compliance with some of these things so uh, it's not about the fact that we have process or we are trying to put process in place the main thing is that we are ensuring that there's strict compliance with some of these processes and that is what the government needs to do correctly and i think we are in a, we are now in a, in a technology war and it should be easier for, for the government to actually monitor some of these things uh, while working directly with some of these road to change businesses. So that they actually reiterated it is a very good one. That we now actually actually enforce compliance is another thing that uh, that needs to be done. And if you remember the when the NA, NFI you also mentioned that uh, they are they are to actually ensure strict compliance 
uh, with the reporting or what is required of, of people. And, that, and I think that is, that's a great one because another thing for you to actually want to require people to submit reports is another thing is to enforce that those reports are actually submitted. And that's very necessary. Okay. Uh, Aladipa Jai, head of fixed income and FX, Chapel Hill Denham Securities. It was nice talking to you. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you very much, Nico, for having me. So in our last report, we want to look at um, the Central Bank of Nigeria that has disclosed that it will be allocating about $10,000 to each bureau, the change operator, at 1,251 naira to a dollar. And this was contained in a circular signed by the bank's director of trade and exchange department, Dr. Hassan Mahmoud, on Monday. Now, the FX Bank directed each BDC to sell the dollars to eligible customers at a rate not exceeding 1.5% above the purchase price implying the BDCs are not expected to sell above 1,269 naira to a dollar. And right now, Mukhtar Mohammed, CEO, Asher Investment, joins me even as we delve into this particular discussion. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Mukhtar, for joining us. Good morning. So uh, can we say now that the free float of the naira has been paused with this new policy direction? I understand what you are saying. The free flow of the Naira have been, have been fought by this by this action. I don't think so. Hmm. Um, no central bank in the world would allow its currency to just float without intervention. Now, nah, this is not managing. This is intervention in the area of liquidity, and this is what we've been talking about for a while. Um, you don't just allow your currency to maintain that kind of gap when you think there's issues to intervene. You intervene, and that's what the CBN is doing. Even if you say, why is he not intervening to the banking? Why is he intervening to an entity that he has bound? That is, that is a topic for another day. But again, I think the intervention is necessary, especially when your currency is grossly undervalued. You must have confidence in your currency. It's just like if you have a share in a company and the company feels that the shares of that company is not doing well, then, I mean, it's not being priced well by the investors. The company in turn comes in there and buys those shares, but at, even at a higher price to say we have confidence in this uh, company. So that's the same thing I think uh, is happening in this space. The, 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 the CBA is saying, look, our Naira is grossly undervalued, and we think this is, should be the right pricing of the Naira as at this time. So we intervene to bring it to that right price. It's different from managing it. It's intervention. For me, I don't think there's any issue with that. Uh, so now, um, in mitigating the impact of its uh, several policies uh, on the Naira, we see the Central Bank of Nigeria telling the BDCs to sell to eligible end users at a spread of offer price of not more than 1.5% above the purchase price. So can this be enforced? Because that's the question a lot of people are asking. And how will they even know that the BDCs are transparent and complying with this directive? I can't but I agree with you. I think I'm among those full of, full of thought that think, how can this be enforced? Um, if you have about 1,300 and something bureau to change, we don't know how many of them are now, they are going to give this FX. We have a 1,300 and something bureau to change that they, I think 1,371 bureau to change that they, they say are elegit, uh, eligible to receive FX. So how do you manage those bureau to change? And if it's, you are finding it difficult, because the reason they give why they are not um, using the banking, financial sector, the banks especially, was because of monitoring. So if you cannot monitor about 30 banks, how can you monitor about uh, 1,370 bureau change? So I have a, a, a challenge with it. But again, they've said that their, their monitoring will come with, um, I think they said they, they, it, it will come through technology. Some of this cash that they are going to give to this bureau change are not going to be given to them in cash. They are going to give them electronically. And anybody that is going to buy those dollars will also have those dollars transferred by the bureau change to their own domiciliary account. So the bureau change are only allowed to give a minimum. If you are collecting two thousand dollars, they, they are supposed to give you like five hundred. If you are collecting four thousand dollars, in when you are traveling, they are supposed to give you five hundred dollars. The minimum five. $3,500 should be put on your uh, uh, domiciliary account card. So what I don't know is how where the CBN has, I mean, the Blue Chain have those uh, uh, um, tools to effect this technological um, implementation that the central bank wants from them.
That's for me is my greatest challenge. But I think they can be monitored, like you said, with technology. Okay. Now, we also see that Apex Bank announced um, its decision to sell foreign exchange worth about $20,000 to each eligible uh, BDC operator across the country in February. And um, now about $10,000 has been sold to the BDCs. So can this sort of supply effectively take care of the demand for dollars? Well, Lekon, you must also look at it that they, 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 is, they call it the end user. Um, those that want high FX inflow, uh, uh, outflow or need FX above um, maybe 10,000, 5,000, I mean, above 10,000, we'll have to source for that through the autonomous foreign exchange market. The bureau change are made to are meant to, to take care of the retail end, which are normally should not be more than 3,000, 4,000, 5,000. That's why the building change were established, not for them to take care of uh, 10, 000, um, 20,000, 50,000, 100,000, even going as far as 300,000. No, that was not what the building change were established for. It's to meet end user. Now, with that crazy strike stability, the challenge we have seen in the FX market up to now has to do with demand and supply. Now, supply in terms of that, the number of people demand for those smaller retail trust and um, supply has superseded those demanding in the uh, uh, autonomous um, foreign exchange market. So that's why we saw that the parallel market was just opened up more than the autonomous foreign exchange market. So now with this, you could see a balance because that means liquidity have been injected into the system. The Nigerian um, FX system is suffering because we've not been able to inject liquidity into the system. So this will go a far way, a, a, a far in trying to bring that liquidity. And once that liquidity comes, if it can be continually enhanced, whereby the market, the CBM will intervene, not always, not all the time, but sometimes when they think the Naira has been inadequately priced, then we will we'll now finally get to that stability whereby CBM will not need to intervene market forces will determine the real value and that value that market forces determine is the real real insurance value of the naira okay so let's switch from that and quickly touch on uh, the issue around the adoption of um, sustainability financial reporting standards by nigeria and how that can help boost um, the nigerian economy now um the financial reporting council of nigeria unveiled a roadmap for adopting sustainability financial reporting standards, marking Nigeria as the first African country to do so. Now, the CEO of FRCN, that is Rabi Olowo, highlighted this milestone as Nigeria's third step towards implementing the standards. And he emphasized that its significance is aimed at attracting foreign direct investment and fostering economic growth. So quickly, how would you rate this action? Would you say it is timely? And would you say that the implementation is apt and will be able to help Nigeria achieve its um, desired goal? Hey, Lekon, I just, uh, I mean, I'll speak to your guest um, before going, was talking about um, if you will be able to implement some of the things that we've reported. And uh, so that is for me also is a challenge that I'll see with this, how implementable is this, how can, how can they implement it? And how many business are they going to use in implementing it? And you see, when the government start looking for a particular product, it seems to become an all common favorable to get impact for the president Tell this person like, oh, yeah, they're all stepping his dream. That's why they are now saying, oh, we are doing this because we want to attract foreign investors. Foreign investors started coming, and they are coming because of the, the bond that the DMO is offering. Just today, the DMO has made us to understand that they are offering a bond to foreign investors at 22%. And that is what we've always been saying, that um, we needed all of these things to pump in place and then make sure that they... They, uh, they get some of these uh, things on, on ground. So I think it's a good one. We we'll attract foreign investors. It will bring confidence in your financial system because it's a global way of reporting. So it is a good thing, especially if you are going to attract foreign direct investors, those that want to come and decide. They want to come because there is rule of law and there's intellectual property protection. I think it's a good one if we are able to implement it because Nigeria has not developed documents. Our main challenge has been how to implement what we have already agreed on. 
So do you think this could be pivotal for the African continent looking at other countries that might want to adopt um, this particular strategy? Yes, it will, especially if those countries begin to see that uh, most of the investment that they are thinking will come to their country begin to come to Nigeria and talking to these investors, they say we are going there because they have a more better uh, uh, financial reporting council standard. So that also will help them want to build it up. And in the long run, they are building an African economy that will attract more investors. So I, I totally agree with that. And you know, Nigeria is always the big brother, the first in almost everything. And then other nations carry that, take it from there. And sometimes they tend to achieve more results than even us, maybe because of their population. But wow. I think it's a good thing that we have finally adopted that. It will bring investors into our country, our country. It will make people believe in our country, especially our financial institution. When they report, this is what they report, because that is the modality, international best practice. They will be accepted even in their own places and even in Nigeria. Okay. Thank you so much, Mukhtar Mohammed, CEO of Asia Dynamic Invest uh, Investment. It was nice talking to you. All right. That's Thank it. You. Of course, that's it on today's edition of Business Edge. Um, don't forget that you can reach out to us by following our social media handles at News Central TV is for call. Don't forget you can also head on to our website www.newscentral.africa and equally download our mobile app on App Store and Play Store. Until next time, I am Lee Konobanjo. Enjoy your day.